Ernie, I want to talk to you a little bit about postmodern theology. Now, there's not many people who want to hear about postmodern theology. I mean, it's... Hi, a, Mom and Dad. <laughs> <laughs> it's esoteric. It's esoteric uh, topic, but I, I, I want to, I've asked you to do it with me because I think you'll help me to make it concrete or apply it to what people are thinking today. So uh, when I talk about postmodern theology, I, what I'm suggesting is that when the avant-garde theologians get together, they say the way we've been doing theology in even the recent past ha has not been all that great, and we have to take into consideration new events in the world and uh, develop uh, new approaches to doing theology. Now, let me just give a couple of concrete examples. Postmodern theology is uh, as we say, post-enlightenment. What that means is, is that in the modern world we put too much emphasis on reason and what science can do, and therefore we have forgotten other aspects of what it means to be human. Therefore, a post-modern theology is going to try to get in other factors like the emotional and the imaginative and the way stories influence us and so on. That's an example of what I mean. So post-modern uh, theology will have to be post-patriarchal. That is, it'll have to try to do theology from the viewpoint of women and not get bogged down in the sexist uh, outlook and ideology that a lot of us have been raised in. Yeah, another way that they talk, and this is what I want to focus on now, is that uh, post-modern theology has to be post-colonial. That is, it has to begin to see the world as an interdependent uh, set of nations and uh, in which one nation or group of nations do not dominate all of the other ones, in which the experience of people all over the globe is taken seriously. So I want to begin to talk about this post-colonial side uh, of it. Uh, and, I, and when I say colonial, I mean the kind of colonialism practiced by both the East and the West. Yes, uh, absolutely, Jim. Uh, with the crises we're presently experiencing in the in the world, uh, seeing people a, as other or looking through a hierarchical lens where white Western have it, uh, our country right or wrong has it more than anyone else. So, but then by definition, a theologian steeped in the uh, the Western tradition has more truth than other people have. Uh, e even if the Western theologian has no sense of the other's experience, the other's experience in a classical theology is not relevant. And hopefully the, the postmodern experience will make, the postmodern theology will make the experience of all people e equally important. We will listen to other people and what they have to say, as hopefully they might listen to us. Yes, that would be the practical results of moving in that direction, wouldn't it? But what, what seems to block us is the power of the paradigms within which uh, we were raised and the general models that have governed our way of organizing experience and organizing our behavior in the past. In other words, I think we have to get into the mix here the way paradigms work. In other words, what postmodern theology is saying we need a whole new paradigm. In fact, we are in process of developing it, but this is a painful transition period and where many of one's uh, favored assumptions are now challenged and one's prejudices are brought to light. But we have to realize the power that paradigms have to shape our consciousness and determine what we see. It's like an imaginative grid through which we look at the world. And therefore, I mean, say it, put it concretely, to grow up in the United States is to think that our culture here is the best and uh, is far advanced over any other culture and that we have uh, progress and uh, that we know how the world should be organized and we've achieved uh, political democracy and all of this and then we say that's the way the world should be. Now we look at the other people and they're deficient in relationship to us. Exactly. And therefore, we are really not able to see their values. That's what it means to be caught up in a paradigm of uh, dominance here, of a Western paradigm that says our way is the only way. That's exactly. to be in the colonial mindset. Exactly. And I don't think either you or I are raving nationalists, for instance, but nevertheless, the paradigms that we've been raised in, the worldviews we have been raised in, organize and 
provide us with particular values, wrong or right, through, through which we look at the world. It seems to me that ultimately other people who are not presently theologians, who are brought up in different traditions, have at least as much to offer us. And maybe they ought to be writing our theology with their lens. It's in a new theology, a postmodern theology, what they have to say ultimately is at least as relevant as what, <coughs> excuse me, what we have to say. I, I think that's already happened in a sense in the United States with liberation theology. Liberation theology developed in Latin America, which looks at the scriptures from the viewpoint of the poor and uh, finds an organizational pattern in what we call the base communities, that is, Christians in small numbers coming together to read the scriptures to see what it means about their social situation. It's a, it's a very liberating kind of approach. Well, that whole idea of liberation theology with a lot of other elements that it brings, uh, rereading of the scriptures, the viewpoint of Jesus the liberator, and the Exodus event in the Hebrew scriptures, has influenced the United States to a great extent. I mean, more than one might usually think. Um, I think quite remarkably so. In other words, uh, liberation theology has made our magazines. You know, it's been in Time magazine. I would say more people know the phrase liberation theology than probably any other kind, really, uh, because of the play it's gotten. Of course, that's been for political reasons and social reasons that it's gotten that play. But it has begun to, to influence us. And uh, many theologians writing in the United States find themselves adopting <coughs> their categories or using their approaches or calling for the more base communities in the United States and so on. Now, one of my own viewpoints has been that you can't just translate that theology. You can't just bring it from Latin America and place it here in the United States on our experience because it doesn't fit in many ways because uh, the Marxist analysis they use doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to me in terms of democratic capitalism and the way we are structured economically. But uh, all I'm saying is that you said that we, in a postmodern theology, we ought to be listening to the theologies that are developed in other cultures and it actually has happened in this case. And we have a model for it. Exactly, and it, it changes and it, it informs our particular worldview, our, our model to be open, open to other options. It provides us ultimately with other choices of, of views. Not, not that we have to agree, but to recognize, for instance, there are other ways of reading the basic texts besides our particular lens. And as I agree that liberation theology, as it's meant down in South America, may not work for us in the society, but we cannot help by be, being informed by it, by having our, our lens, the way we view the world, somewhat reshaped. But it's, it's still a long, tedious, painful process for those of us who are steeped in, in, in the colonial, hierarchical, we have it, they don't outlook of, uh, of the United States, for instance. You know, one of the things that seems to have challenged so much this uh, colonial outlook that we're using is, is our interaction with the Soviet Union and the way some of that has changed and the way we view a lot of that. I mean, you know, we have been terribly upset by the Soviet uh, colonialism in Afghanistan, for example. That, uh, you know, was a terrible experience. It caused a lot of difficulty in the United States. We seem to need to react and to support the rebels there and, and have condemned that worldwide and so on. And then, then to see the Soviets pull out of there and to sort of almost make a national uh, confession, in a sense, that it was a mistake, something we never would have expected to see in the Soviet Union. Here they're saying this was a mistake to go in there. It's hurt us, and our soldiers returning have an experience somewhat similar to our soldiers returning from Vietnam, very painful experience for them. Um, well, that begins to, to challenge some of our own colonialist mentality, it seems to me, uh, th that interaction with the Soviet Union. Of course, I'm not saying that doesn't change our policy. I mean, we still went into Panama. And, I, 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 and the Gulf, yes. I mean, they, they pulled out of Afghanistan before we continued what some people might consider our colonial policies. Uh, so, you know, we are I I informed by these changes, 
but that uh, doesn't mean we change our behaviors, our lenses overnight. No, but it begins to challenge some of the assumptions. And of course the challenge comes from other places, like for example the uh, Pope John Paul II wrote an encyclical called On Social Concerns. And uh, here's a man, uh, you know, not tied to any of the economic systems and uh, uh, representing a supposedly an overarching viewpoint. He comes up with a tremendous criticism of both capitalism and socialistic economies as we know it. But then he says the problem is that we have all these north south problems. We keep looking at them with the lens of the east west conflict. Exactly. You know, I mean, that's a powerful kind of notion. It's, it shows you how paradigms work. In other words, we keep, for all this period of the Cold War, have looked at the global situation in East-West terms. The Soviet expansionism was our great problem. They, we had, that had to be contained. That fueled a whole anti-communist sentiment in the United States, shaped a lot of our politics. I mean, politicians had to run on producing, uh, m getting more money for weapons to defend against the Soviet Union. It really was an East-West paradigm, and it had a colonialist aspect to it because it was almost as though we were carving up the world between these two superpowers or blocks. And uh, the Pope then comes out from another vantage point and says, well, wait a second, the world shouldn't be looked at in East-West terms only because when you do that, then you don't recognize the North-South problem. The North-South problem is you've got developed nations who are relatively well off in the North and not attending to the needs of the developing countries in the South. So he's calling for a paradigm shift. He's, in that sense, we could say Pope John Paul II is postmodern. Uh, he moved beyond the colonialist mentality, at least in that one aspect we would see him as being postmodern. And uh, I think it challenges that, that paradigm that really has operated for uh, all through the Cold War period, and it becomes very difficult to, be, to see the world in other terms. Exactly. It sometimes seems like the United States doesn't do terribly well without making somebody the other. And once we're able to make somebody the other, then we can mobilize against them and they are the bad guys and we are the good guys. And uh, when we don't have that, when we don't have East-West, uh, uh, rather like we need to find other conflicts to support our idea of the other the and superiority that goes with it. Exactly. I think, don't you think that's part of the psychological side of it? Is that I've got to be better than somebody? Yeah, but once again, better is paradigmatically uh, defined I in terms of better means uh, better. Number one is important, uh, but I'm better in this, in this, in this, in this. If we want to talk about better in objective terms, we can say that the Soviet Union ha has moved beyond us uh, in many ethical and moral terms, uh, uh, in terms of having tr attempting to have a dialogue with all their people, publicly owning errors, etc., etc., uh, trying being perhaps more attentive to their economy than we are. They're not dependent on a wartime economy, et cetera. Well, I think that one of the ways you could see us, the openness in the United States happen is the response to Mikhail Gorbachev. I mean, I, I think that the popular outpouring, in fact, when I was in the Soviet Union the, in Moscow, the people were saying, we can't understand why Gorbachev is so popular in the West. I mean, you know, they're saying we're, our stores are more bare than they were before and we can't get consumer goods and Gorbachev's been in all these years and hasn't accomplished anything. How come he's so popular? But I'm looking at it in this case from another viewpoint and saying it, it's quite a remarkable openness on the part of people in the United States to see him in his favorable light as they do after being steeped in a Cold War mentality all these years, anti-communist, and they're the bad people, especially the members of the Politburo and the Soviet uh, hierarchy. Those are the ones who are really messing up our world. And suddenly Gorbachev comes along, and people seem to be open to him. And, uh, I mean, I think that speaks well for us, really. I mean, I think that that's a, a very positive thing, a uh, reaction here in the United States. Oh, absolutely, though I, I tend to think we're somewhat media-driven and, and vulnerable to style over content. <laughs> and if his style is, is the perception 
uh, communicated by the media and his content is his inability to accomplish things uh, for his people then that may say something about our emphasis on style when I think of the last few presidential elections or gubernatorial or congressional uh, and in our value system style still seems to be more important than getting stuff done the people that want to get stuff done and, and, and try to aren't held as in high esteem as the people who rhetoricize about. Uh, so maybe Gorbachev made it when he plunged into the crowd when he was visiting the United States and shook hands with people and uh, made this other kind oh, of Oh, exactly. Uh, yeah. Plus, we weren't sure what we felt about Nancy Reagan, and when she disconfirmed Raisa, then, then we thought maybe, well, you know, the Gorbachevs are okay. If Nancy <laughs> Reagan doesn't like Raisa, yeah. then perhaps... She's okay. Well, we're, 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 the, all that we're talking about here is trying to get at this business of the power of the paradigms to influence us and whether uh, to what degree we can move beyond them. I mean, the postmodern theology wants to move us away from uh, this uh, excessive nationalism and move us into an interdependent world. The, the, the postmodern theologians are saying, well, you can't just do theology from one perspective. You can't just have a theology dominated by uh, Europe or the United States, because what it misses is the indigenous experience, the valuable experience of people all over the world. Oh, yes, it closes out even the possibility of other people's experience. Uh, Kenneth Burke said a very wise thing. He said, every way of seeing is also a way of not seeing. You're absolutely uh, right. I, I, and when we see the way we have historically we preclude the possibility of being attentive to other people's experience. It has no value in the paradigm in which we're locked. And so I think it's critical to recognize that and to constantly monitor ourselves. And I think the idea of a postmodernist theology suggests a lot of self monitoring as individuals, as communities, as nations, as a world. Are the assumptions we are operating on, are the values we are implying worth holding on to? Yeah, I, I think that's true. And, you know, I think of it historically, too, Ernie, because um, when you think about th this need to be superior or not taking another culture seriously, of course, we have the great example of that in the way the Native Indians were treated here in the United States, the Native Americans. Um, that they, their culture was just dismissed. I mean, the mindset that drove the settlers was that those people, only two things you could do with them, that it was either convert them to Christianity or kill them. That, that was, uh, there was no sense of the, of the uh, great culture which they themselves had or the possibility of learning or, or ending in, in, into dialogue. So we have a history of that. And you know, the other thing that struck me as you were talking was uh, this idea that we have to, uh, this colonial mentality says you have to have someone you're superior to. I remember a movie, and I can't think of the title, maybe you know it, but the line is, the son finds out that his father killed the mule, white father, killed the mule of a black farmer living next to him. And his father at the time said something, well, well, unless there's somebody around lower than you, you're not really a person or a man. Um, I don't know if it's Mississippi Burning or might have been the movie. I don't remember the I movie, remember but it's either. a telling line to me, and I think it says something psychologically that we ought to be alert to right now. When there's when anti-communism is no longer the big thing in the country, and and hating the Soviet Union and being against them. Who are we against now? And is there a psychological need to have a scapegoat or to have someone to look down upon? I wonder if it's connection. I just in my popped in my mind. Is there a connection between the rise of racism in the United States now and the lack of the Soviet Union as our enemy? As I think the Soviets said that we've deprived you of an enemy. Now what are you going to do? Oh, <coughs> and, uh, and and of course, you know, what does theology have to say to that? when we think of, of theology often ha has confirmed the the prevailing social values and social views. The people who mistreated the Native Americans, for instance, had great biblical support for doing that, found by uh, you know, p particular fundamentalists p finding particular scriptural texts which said that we have it and they, and they don't and, and they are one level above nothing. Uh, 
That's right. There's always been biblical support, always been theologians who can support that sort of nationalism or colonialist uh, mentality. Yes, that, that God lives in the United States, and that's what our theologians tell us. So the postmodern theology must insist now on another way of viewing the world. And I think it starts out with this idea, well, we live in the global village. We're uh, interdependent on this earth, that cultures have their own integrity and value. And that what we've got to see is the development of an indigenous theology throughout the world. So that begins to happen. Now, in some of the journals, you will read uh, articles about African theology or Asian theology that has a distinctive uh, tenor and uh, brings out themes that maybe we haven't seen before. I was thinking about uh, in China, when we get an indigenous Christianity in China and how they will work in the question of the ancestors and their importance. Uh, the Feast of All Saints might become an extremely important uh, feast in, in um, China when one has the opportunity of honoring the ancestors and so on. This is an example of what might happen as we would move into a post-colonial world. We would now have a dialogue situation in which we would be trying to learn from the various cultures. Exactly. Very, very powerful thing, I think, that would happen. So, so po postmodern theology has a, a, not only a negative critique, but it has a positive program, in a sense. At least it's trying to be developed now, where we would enter into to dialogue like that. James Cone, the black theologian, said about 15 years ago that if you're not black, you're not Christian. A and that upset a lot of people, but he, he explained it to mean that if you had no awareness of what it was like to be the other, if you could not feel like the black person feels, or, or the Asian person, or the African person, then holding Christian values is almost irrelevant because you marginalized people. Uh, and that makes a, a lot of sense, I think, in the postmodern theology. Yes. Let's stop marginalizing. Right. <laughs> I think you have to have some sort of a perception that there's a value in the other culture in the other group of people, that there's something they have to contribute to the dialogue that you could learn, or put negatively, that you are diminished by ruling them out. I mean, you can take the perfect example of our environmental crisis in the United States. Would our whole history not have looked differently? It looked different if the experience of the American Indians, who were so conscious of the earth, was taken into account. I mean, can you imagine the pollution that we currently have if we had been in dialogue with the American Indians and taken their experience seriously, I would say no. It would have influenced policy in one way or another exactly. so that you wouldn't end up with the industrial kind of pollution that we've known or just the, the raping of the earth, as it's called. But you, you will recall popular theology at that time supported the idea from Genesis that man has dominion over everything, and we're supposed to make it work for us. Okay. You know, Taken into Baconian science, where uh, we are here to men are here to manipulate and reorganize with, with no sense of living in harmony, but more a sense of we control it, we have dominion over it. I think, yeah, absolutely correct. There was, again, a biblical warrant for that kind of behavior. And it's, again, back the idea that the uh, religious traditions do influence behavior. They are not simply ivory tower ideologies, but they, the average person drinks in the faith and drinks in a world view and has a paradigm uh, that shapes their consciousness because of, very often, the religious tradition in which they live. And so what we've got to do now is, is sort of break out of that. My teacher, Carl Paul Rahner says that one of the ways we will do this is that we're moving into, for the first time in history, where the church will be seen as a world church. Instead of a church that is sort of is centered in Rome and has a, a European mentality or an Anglo-European mentality, it will become a world church for the first time in which the experience of all the different cultures will be taken seriously, in which Christianity will find an indigenous form in various countries, and that uh, the church will be then enriched by this varied experience. So instead of Europe saying, this is how you have to be Christian, people will hear the story of Jesus. Jesus and uh, in, appropriate the gospel and find their own way to make it real. That be that is really a post-colonial world that Rahner is talking about. The church becoming a world church for the very first time in history. That's an exciting kind of idea, it seems to me. It, it's exciting. <clears throat> it, it's also rather threatening. Uh, if all my values are provisional, 
uh, where does my centeredness lie? Uh, where is my core? And if I'm open to everybody else's view at all times, what do I hold on to that's consistent? Besides the idea that maybe I don't have anything to hold on to. Well, Ernie, mm -hmm. boy, that that raises large question with not much time to talk about it. But for me, you know, you got to get back to the idea that uh, for in the Christian world, Jesus Christ remains our model. He's the parable of the Father, the best we've produced, a model of how human existence ought to be, and he's witnessed to in the New Testament. So that that really there is a normative value for us in in the New Testament, and there's sort of a core faith in Christ and a essential way of trying to follow him as the model and as the leader. And uh, so I, I would put those two things together there, Christ as the model and uh, the one who continues to criticize us and liberate us and enrich us, and then the New Testament, which becomes normative for the life of the faith community. Now, that's a thumbnail answer, but uh, I think something has to be solid in all this. You're talking postmodern theology wants to recover, I think, that at centrality. You got very few seconds. Well, yeah, I think faith there, Jim, is a key word. The faith is the center. And, uh, you know, biblical texts are interpreted by theologians, and, and that's a problem. But by the whole community as well. Yes. In other words, the whole community of people reads those texts and makes them their own. Oh, Ernie, we've opened up something we can't handle, bigger than we are at the moment. But what we've tried to do is look at postmodern theology, said it moves us beyond the colonialist mentality and says, let's see the interdependent world. Let's learn from other cultures. Let's have a, indigenous theologies, and let's move towards a world church. And then we'll all be enriched, especially if we can hang on to the fundamentals of our faith in Christ and the normative character of the Scriptures.